Well, I've served in the government off and on over a course of 50 or 60 years. I resigned a number of times. And I was fired a number of times. I think I appeared before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee at least nine times in confirmation hearings for the same job. What could we do in the event of a nuclear war? 50 weapons would destroy most of the urban population of the United States. So what we ne really needed to do was to keep the war from arising. That would be a valuable thing for them and for us. And there are those who say we could have done better by accommodating the Russians earlier. I don't believe that to be true. I think they really don't understand what tough man Stalin was and what miserable sons of bitches he had working for him. When the situation gets dangerous, one should try to eliminate all emotion from one's analysis. And that one should indeed become a very cold-blooded analyst. That, I think, perhaps justifies the epithet of cold warrior. My own view is it was necessary and it was effective. So I stand condemned of what I think was a minor crime. Ambassador Paul Henry Nitze was born on January 16, 1907. In 1909, he moved to Chicago, where he attended the University of Chicago High School. My father was a professor at the University of Chicago, and amongst the professors there, they were the most brilliant group in their fields in the United States at the time. I had noted that when a real problem arose, None of those great men at the University of Chicago had any influence on it whatsoever. And because of their separation from impact upon policy, I thought that it was necessary to do something else. And I decided that the first thing that had to be done for me was to make some money, and be having made some money, then to use that to achieve some position in the government where I could have an impact upon international affairs. As an investment banker on Wall Street from 1929 to 1940, Nitsa began to build his fortune. I was associated with Dillon Reed and Company in New York. And the president of Dillon Reed and Company was James Forrestal. And I was the executive director, I guess. James Forrestal was asked whether he would consider an important job in Washington as a one of the confidential advisors to the president. And Jim asked me what I thought he should do. So I said, if you don't accept this challenge, you'll regret that you didn't give yourself a chance to do greater things than just our business of making money. I think he said, damn you, Paul. <laughs> but in any case, he agreed with me. And he then asked me that if he did go, would I be willing to come and help him. And I said, yes, I would. As a director of the U.S. Strategic Bombing Survey, Nitze had evaluated the effects of air raids on the German war effort. He was completing his report in Washington when the United States dropped the atomic bomb on Japan in August 1945. I did not and do not now think that it was necessary. Japan was no longer any threat to us at all. The Japanese fleet had been sunk and most of their merchant marine and even their railroads were interrupted by our bombing of the, of the rail junctions, etc. So Japan was just hanging on a rope. I thought by November of that year, the Japanese would come to us and wish to negotiate on our terms 
and that would be a much more favorable outcome than dropping the bomb or getting the Russians into it or any of the things that otherwise were suggested. But I was rather alone on that. As vice chairman of the Pacific Bombing Survey, Nitsa was in Hiroshima and Nagasaki only two months after the bombs had detonated. Well, I rather shared the belief that the Japanese had been brutal in Pearl Harbor, and that the quicker we got rid of all these Japanese, the better off the world would be. But then when I got to Japan, and I can remember going to an underground aircraft engine plant in the north of the Tokyo Plain, and I gave some candy to four little boys who were, seemed to be lurking around. And uh, when I finally went down into this underground mine and then came out again, <clears throat> there were the four little boys all in a row, all with presents for me. And this lady in the background who was, wanted to see to it that they abided by Japanese culture and did the right thing. Pressed me a great deal. The wartime alliance between the United States and the Soviet Union began to splinter almost immediately after the fighting ended. In 1946, Nitsa was among the first apprehensive of Soviet intentions. As I recall, on February 9th, we got word of a speech by Stalin, which I interpreted as being a delayed declaration of war against the United States. He described the state of the world in those days, why it might for the short run be necessary to cooperate with the United States. But in the long run, it was essential to overcome the United States and all its influence worldwide so that the world could be a peaceful world dominated by socialists, by which he meant really communists, but that was the word that was used. So I went to see Dean Acheson, whom I'd known for years, and began my tale to him of why I thought there was a danger the Russians would be a substantial worry to us in the future. And he threw me out of his office. He said that I didn't know anything about the subject, that I should get out of the office right away, which I did. In the spring of 1947, Secretary of State George Marshall created the policy planning staff to handle long-range foreign policy problems. George Kennan, a distinguished foreign service officer, was appointed its first director. Well, George really knew a lot about Russia, and he was amongst the first to really condemn Stalin and thought that Stalin was a threat to Russia and Russian culture, and that he was against all the things in Russia which made Russia a great country. The whole theory of the containment policy as it was developed by George Kennan, supported by me, was that if one could keep the Soviet Union from expanding, they would have to look inward to see what was happening to their own political system and their own economy. And once they began to look inward and dealt with their own domestic problems, then this would be a changed Soviet Union. The political and economic turmoil in war-torn Europe gave the policy planning staff an early opportunity to test the containment doctrine. The Marshall Plan, built upon the staff's recommendations, was first articulated by Marshall in his June 5, 1947 speech at Harvard University's commencement. I need not tell you that the world situation is very serious. People in the cities are short of food and fuel, and in some places, approaching the starvation limit. The truth is a matter Well, we'd written the speech for him. Chip Boland, Emmett Hughes, and I, the original ideas in that speech were really more Chip Boland's than anybody else's. And he was the one who coined the various phrases that this was uh, addressed to a humanitarian cause that was not directed Our against anybody. Directed not against any country or doctrine, but against hunger, poverty, desperation, and chaos. It was a good speech. <laughs> Produced tremendous effects. Communist actions in Europe and China, followed by Russia's successful testing of an atomic bomb, prompted President Truman to order an immediate reevaluation of national security policy. Nitsa, now director of the policy planning staff, represented the State Department in this deliberation. We went at the job of a 
radical, fundamental review of U.S. policy, its basics, bases, and what we ought to do in the future. And that document, having been directed by the National Security Council, was called NSC 68. It set forth ways we could improve the capability of our military forces, why we should do that, and what the significance would be of such a strengthening. The defense budget had been someplace between 12 and a half and 13 billion dollars a year. And my estimate as to what this program that we were recommending would cost was 40 billion dollars a year. I told Dean Atchison that that was my estimate and asked his advice as to whether we should put it in the report. And Atchison said, for goodness sakes, don't. It is important to get the policy agreed first and then address those things such as money cost, et cetera, et cetera. So I didn't put any estimate into the paper at all. The present time. The fear of another great international war overshadows all the hopes of mankind. This fear arises from the tensions between nations and from the recent outbreak of open aggression in Korea. We in the policy planning staff thought that the attack from North Korea into South Korea was in fact a demonstration and that our estimates had a certain degree of validity important principle of Soviet doctrine was when the correlation of forces was negative, one should draw in one's horns and try to be as careful as possible. But when the correlation of forces was positive to your side, then you were duty bound to exploit that positive correlation because it might go away if you didn't uh, exploit it right away. The Soviet testing of a nuclear device would be considered by the Soviets as a change in their favor in the correlation of forces. And that therefore, one should expect the Soviets to test an exploitation of that superiority someplace on their periphery. The most likely place was Korea. This was the kind of thing that we had predicted or was consistent with our analysis of the Soviet Union and its possible actions in NSC 68. So NSC 68 became really widely accepted and did form the basis of U.S. security policy. Under the conditions which now exist in the world to provide a defense against aggression is the only way to maintain peace. When President Eisenhower came into office, I was, in effect, fired. Senator McCarthy said that he had a list of 20-odd members of the State Department, all of whom he knew were Soviet agents. I was not on the list, but many of my friends were on the list. I was particularly outraged when McCarthy denigrated General George C. Marshall. I considered Marshall a hero selfless, honorable, a first-rate man of character. At the time, I was still a registered Republican. When the Senate Republicans and then McCarthy began to take apart Marshall for political reasons, and when Eisenhower failed to defend his old boss, it helped me decide to switch parties. When I left the government, I decided I would hang my hat in the School of Advanced International Studies which Chris Herter and I had founded many years earlier. In 1942, Chris and I were discussing what kind of a post-war world did the United States like to see and how did one keep the United States from going back to what had happened after World War I, where the sentiment of let's get back to normalcy was the slogan of the day. And we decided that perhaps the best thing to do was to create a, a center in Washington of independent thought. Well, when I joined the academic community and surveyed the literature, most of it was historical. They'd give courses in current affairs, but they had no theoretical background at all. And I complained to various people that where, why has the United States academia been so deficient in 
addressing themselves from an experienced and theoretical view as to the practice of foreign policy. And the answer was, well, nobody's really addressed that yet. Why don't you address it? So after having been for nine years in the government and having gotten used to being supported by all the facilities of help that a government can give, I suddenly found myself on my own. And I had bought a car. I couldn't get the car out of the dealer's lot without running into the car behind me and then the car ahead of me and then getting into trouble when I was exiting the lot so that I had made three grievous errors by the time I got to my, got to the, my own office. Yeah. Out of my course that I was giving, which dealt with the theory and practice of foreign and defense policy, I did publish a whole series of articles. One, the role of the learned man in government, and there I really had in mind George Kennan, because what I was advocating was someone who is not just an historian or interested in the history of foreign relations, who was familiar with the actual practice thereof and had some real idea as to how it was conducted. We were trying to educate our students in the field of foreign and defense policy. Some people became just practitioners and did not think back to any theoretical base. But when we joined Johns Hopkins, we had built a team of people there at the school who were first class and did extremely good work. It's clear that the United States needs some work on the more theoretical aspects of the analysis of foreign policy, but work that can be useful to the practitioners. Here, our role is central in the world, and if nobody in the United States really has done some rigorous thinking about the bases of policy, they're not going to be very good at it. When administrations changed and Atchison was no longer Secretary of State, he never came to Washington at all, trying to avoid the scene. I invited Atchison to have lunch, and he told me that I was the first person in Washington who had called him and invited him to anything since he'd ceased to be in office. Atchison never forgot that, and so he and I used to have lunch at this one table week after week after week. And uh, it was a great period. In 1957, NHTSA established at SAIS the Washington Center for Foreign Policy Research, now the Foreign Policy Institute, as an academic think tank. It was suggested that I was trying to create a policy planning staff in exile, oriented in the direction of Democratic Party's thought. I tried to raise $100,000 for this particular venture, and nobody would give me a penny because they thought it might not be liked by the Republican administration. When Milton Eisenhower became the president of Johns Hopkins University, then Milton would protect us as far as the Republican politics was concerned, and having the correct political backing and going for a substantial sum turned out to be a 10 strike. I never was able to raise the 100,000, but we raised the 5 million in a period of a few weeks. During Eisenhower's eight years in office, NHTSA stayed at SAIS, but remained a powerful voice in international security affairs. In the election of 1960, NHTSA advised Democratic candidate John F. Kennedy on national security policy. Later that year, NHTSA was offered a job in the Kennedy administration by Secretary of State Dean Rusk. Dean Rusk called me up and he said, I'm with the president and we have three different positions which we think you could do well with. But we need a decision within 30 seconds, I guess it was. One of them was the advisor to the president with respect to the uh, National Security Council. And I thought that was too close to the seat of power to be a place from which you could do any planning work. 
So I said, no, I'd like to be Deputy Secretary of Defense. And uh, the president said yes, but then offered the job of Secretary of Defense to Robert McNamara, who wanted somebody as his deputy who would not fight with him, but would really just execute. And he thought that I was not that type. I had ideas of my own and wouldn't fit into that. And he offered me the job of ISA, the Office of International Security Affairs. And I was worried about this. It was a come down from what I thought the president had offered me. And I tried to call the president. He was down in Florida. And the president wouldn't take my call. So I got the clear-cut message that it was this or nothing. And uh, so I told McNamara, yes, I would take the job. And I've never regretted having done that. In this position, Nitsa was closely involved with U.S. response to the Berlin and Cuban missile crises. The world is not deceived by the communist attempt to label Berlin as a hotbed of war. There is peace in Berlin today. The source of world trouble and tension is Moscow, not Berlin. And if war begins, it will have begun in Moscow and not Berlin. It didn't occur to any of us that the Russians would build a wall. And when they did begin the construction of this wall, the immediate thought was, well, why don't we just go and knock it down? But I got information that the Russians had positioned a full division secretly at the end of the Berlin enclave. Why would they do it secretly unless they intended to use it with surprise? The only thing that I could see that we could do was try to outface the Russians. We thought they had much greater conventional military power than we did. And we also thought that they had superiority in nuclear weapons, but that it was also necessary to stand up to them because Berlin was more important to us than getting us out of Berlin was important to them. That's the thesis on which we operated, but it certainly was a dangerous period. I have never since lived through a period when I thought the risk was as great as I thought it then, if that crisis in Berlin. By the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, I was wholly persuaded that we had increased our strength and that our earlier estimates of their strength were erroneous. Therefore, we were in the best position to act, not the Russians. To halt this offensive buildup, a strict quarantine on all offensive... My view was that we ought to use the minimum force necessary in order to achieve the results that we wanted. The minimum force clearly was on the end of negotiation. But if that didn't work, then we had to be prepared to use force. And if we used force, we had to be prepared for it to escalate to the very highest level. I think those of us who have had experience in the military political field uh, more or less a uniform opinion that when the situation gets more dangerous, then the uh, coldness of the, ana in, uh, the analysis becomes more important. One ought to take as much time as a is available before one makes decisions that are for keeps. In December 1963, Nitsa was sworn in as Secretary of the Navy. With the strong presence of both naval and marine forces in Vietnam at the time, Nitsa became an influential advisor on U.S. policy there. In 1965, he made his first of two visits to Vietnam to assess the military situation. Well, I went to Vietnam, had a very good series of briefings on the situation there, and uh, finally came to understand that guerrilla warfare was something quite different than the type of warfare that U.S. forces were trained to conduct and were good at. The populace there was favorable to the North Vietnamese. We had hoped the North Vietnamese would be viewed by the South Vietnamese as their oppressors, but they didn't look at it that way. And I went back to Washington and talked to McNamara about it and gave him a description. 
of the dangers that I saw there. And he said, what do you think we ought to do? And I said, well, I think we ought to get out because this is a very dangerous situation. And he said, but you've told me all along that the Soviets are apt to act upon their evaluation of the correlation of forces. And wouldn't they interpret this as a favorable development in the correlation of forces? And I said, yes, I would. And haven't you said that they would feel duty bound to exploit that favorable development? and that therefore they would attack us someplace else. And you say it might be in a number of places. Isn't it logical, therefore, for us to stay? And I said, I protested and said, I still think the dangers there are very great. And he said, I understand you think that, but also from your description, one can't be certain that if we withdraw, the dangers won't be greater. And I had no answer to that. So he went ahead. So I don't think Johnson was responsible for our staying on and fighting there in, in Vietnam. Really, the country as a whole was behind that. There was opposition. And I think the majority view in the country was uh, these uh, little people can't really do us much harm and get this moreover successfully from our point of view. When I returned again to Vietnam in July 1966, I watched as our military indiscriminately bombarded the countryside with lethal artillery fire, what were called harass and destroy missions killing villagers and Viet Cong alike. I toured a hospital and watched while children dying and injured from the shell fire were brought in for treatment. When I returned to Washington, I urged that such tactics would win us more enemies than friends. A lot of the military agreed with me, and eventually harassment fire was stopped. When I was promoted to be Deputy Secretary of Defense under Robert McNamara, I hoped I would be in a better position to influence U.S. policy toward Vietnam, but I still met much resistance. Senator Fulbright was very much disturbed by the way in which the Vietnamese war was no, evolving, and he demanded a hearing on that really subject in the Senate. And I was asked whether I would represent the Defense Department in that hearing. I only raise a few questions that I do not accept your version of what has happened there or why. Since my views differed so radically from McNamara's and the other views in the Pentagon, I thought it was inappropriate for me to testify because I would have to indicate to them an honest disagreement with the executive branch's point of view. And I thought, therefore, it would be much wiser for me to offer my resignation. Nitz's resignation was refused. He continued to serve under Clark Clifford, who replaced Robert McNamara as Secretary of Defense in 1968. Along with former Secretary of State Dean Acheson, Nitza successfully persuaded the Johnson administration to begin negotiations aimed at ending the Vietnam War. Also during this period, Nitza helped plan the first arms control negotiations with the Soviet Union, which were postponed by the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968. Over the next two decades, Nitza would be at the center of U.S. arms control policy. There were very few things that we could talk to the Russians about with any anticipation that we could come out with some mutually beneficial results. We had quite deeply opposed purposes, and each was trying to get the better of the other in some way or another. But on arms control, there seemed to be a better way of working out a modus vivendi. In the tower, the bomb. The concept of mutually assured destruction suggested that in the event 
the Russians were to attack us and destroy, say, 50 of our cities, that we should then respond with destroying 200 of their cities. That seemed to me to be nonsensical. The U.S. would have difficulty ever recovering and it wouldn't have done us any good to destroy Russia. What earthly gain could we get out of that? If one could develop a situation that was inherently strategically stable, this would be to our advantage because it would reduce the risk that the Russians would want to initiate a, a, a nuclear war. And it would be to their advantage as well. During the Nixon administration, Nitsa was a leading U.S. delegate to the strategic arms limitation talks, which began in 1969. I thought that the SALT I agreement had made an incision, which was a useful one. It laid out a way in which one could envisage levels, agreed levels of armaments on both sides, which would be lower than the existing levels. We used to negotiate part of the time in Helsinki, Finland, and part of the time in Leningrad. When we got to Leningrad, Semyonov, the head of the Soviet delegation, invited us to go to the opera together and then to a reception. And at this reception after the opera, there was a young girl who sang. I expressed admiration of this young girl, her beauty and her ability as a singer. And Semyonov said, would you like to have her? And all kinds of red flags went up. <laughs> and I said, no, she's a beautiful girl. And I thank you very much, but I don't think it's appropriate. <laughs> it was typical of what the Russians would try to do. Even though Semyonov was a perfectly decent person still, he was more or less duty bound to try to entrap me if he could. While we were negotiating with the Soviets on arms control reductions, Henry Kissinger was having a set of private, off-the-record meetings with what he considered to be his opposite numbers at the higher levels of the Soviet government. And he was not keeping us, who were actually negotiating with the Soviets, informed as to what he was promising or what he was indicating in his negotiations. We thought that was a not the right way to run a railroad, to keep his subordinates uninformed of what was going on. And B, we thought it was dangerous because we didn't think that he understood the nuclear control business very well and that he was apt to make mistakes because he didn't, wasn't seeking advice from those who really knew most about the ins and outs of the nuclear relationship. But nevertheless, I did support the treaty because I thought there was no other way of getting forward. Certainly, we didn't want to have a war, and I thought there was a certain commonality of interests which could be exploited through this forum. In 1972, the Senate ratified the SALT I agreement. Nitsa remained on the negotiating team for SALT II, which began immediately afterwards. While SALT-1 limited and froze the production of certain missiles, SALT-2 intended to build a lasting framework for strategic stability. The agreement which was finally worked out by Nixon and Henry Kissinger was one which had a very short time duration. It lasted only five years. Therefore, I thought this was an improvident agreement that Mr. Nixon was heading toward and that he was heading toward it for domestic political reasons. He was wrapping himself up in the flag of peace, that he was the person who knew how to negotiate with the Russians, and peace depended upon his continuing in office so that uh, he was using this for his own political purposes, and I thought in an endeavor to protect himself from impeachment. Nitsa resigned from Saul II in 1974. As negotiations carried on despite his disapproval, Nitsa thought former Georgia Governor Jimmy Carter, who won the Democratic nomination in 1976, might support his ideas. I was one of the earliest supporters of President Carter as a candidate for the presidency, largely influenced by my children. Uh, they said, Pa, uh, you're out of date. And as a result of that, I 
sent Mr. Carter some of my speeches and sent him a substantial contribution. And it was a result of that they invited me to come to this meeting at the Plains in which he would meet with his team, as he considered it. Oh, well, you know, there are two ways to, to keep a rough equivalency. One is for us to continue a mad race with the Soviet Union that every time they have a new weapon system, we match it. Every time we have a new one, they match it. And uh, this is what we are trying to avoid with the SALT II talk. And I thought other, that we should we not cut the defense budget, that we should take a much sterner view in our negotiations with the Soviet Union. I found everybody was wanted to say yes to Carter when we got there and approve of his ideas. And the person that really irritated me was Roslyn, where she indicated that she had had private word from God himself that God wished peace with the Soviet Union. It seemed to me that was unfair negotiating ground. I didn't think that the president or his wife should tell me what to think on ground, grounds that they had a special channel to God himself. That seemed to me to be unfair competition. <laughs> it made me angry. Nitsa never joined the Carter administration. Instead, he became a vocal opponent of its defense policies. Even if the Soviet Union does no more than what is permitted by the treaty, they will trouble the number of warheads that they have. They will increase their war fighting capability by a factor of 10. There's an attempt to get at those things indirectly, but it's a very ineffective attempt. And it is for that reason that the end position as a result of the treaty will be so one-sided. The threats we face are more subtle and indirect than was once the case. As a result, awareness of danger is diminished in the United States. We thought the best thing to do was to create a committee, call it the Committee on the Present Danger, to stimulate a debate about the adequacy of the defense posture of the United States. The Committee on the Present Danger did help get increased appropriations for the Congress, increased alertness to the dangers we were running and greater support for an improvement in our national security. The Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979 killed SALT II. In 1980, Committee on the Present Danger member Ronald Reagan was elected president. Inspired by the committee, Reagan shifted arms control policy from simply limiting to reducing nuclear weapons. Throughout Reagan's administration, Nitsa played a crucial role in shaping this policy, first as chief U.S. negotiator at the INF, or Intermediate Range Nuclear Force Talks in 1981, then as special advisor to the president and Secretary of State George Shultz on arms control matters in 1984. Both the U.S. and the Soviet Union have made proposals for limiting missiles in Europe, but both sides remain far apart. It had long been my view that when a negotiation becomes stalled, it is necessary to get at it in some different way, find a new angle by which you can get back onto the negotiating table with some hope of success. And so we went off into the woods. An important part of this story involves two tough men and two tough jobs, the American and Russian negotiators in the Geneva talks. Nitsa is elegant and wealthy, 76 years old, an arms negotiator of great experience, and Paul Nitsi is the ultimate hawk. Yuli Kvitsinsky, 46, young for his job, a brilliant Soviet diplomat and hard as nails. What happened last July was that this American hawk and this Russian professional worked out an unofficial compromise plan to limit the missiles of both sides. This thus became public knowledge that we'd had this walk in the woods. And a playwright by the name of Blessing thought this scene of a Russian and American negotiating in the woods was a good framework for a play. So he wrote this play, which had reversed everything from the reality. He had the Russian being the old wise man and the American being an ingenue kind of a young man who believed in good and therefore was soft on all issues. The old man and the young man become friends and eventually they agree on what they think might be a way in which the problems could be resolved. 
This, of course, differed entirely from the actual facts. I was double the age of Kwiecinski. Uh, we never did become friends. It took me the entire course of the negotiation to uh, really realize what a dreadful and miserable pill he was. <laughs> and uh, our f it's a solution that we tried to work out. It was never accepted by anybody and probably didn't do much good at all. But the play that this man wrote was a first-class play. That INF Treaty had been the principal negotiation between the United States and the Russians for so long that all kinds of other issues got attached to it, really. And to have that negotiation finally succeed in an agreement seemed to me to be a triumph, really a great step forward. From that agreement onward, we could really see a way toward reducing the risk of war. So I think I viewed the Soviet Union with open eyes. I was also prepared to condemn them if I thought they were really conducting an evil course of policy. Uh, I also, I think, had a quality of persistence that uh, I was prepared to battle it along forever and ever for 40 years. And it took that long before one could really feel comfortably that we had weathered that 40-year period with our economy growing, our, our political system in good shape, and that the Soviet Union, regrettably, had not been able to do the same, that they were in a position to help them, but we were not in a position to admire what they had done. And it happened somewhat faster than either George Kennan or I had anticipated. It happened during our lifetime, while we had thought it might happen after our lifetime. In 1985, President Reagan awarded Ambassador Paul Nitze the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Paul is now playing an indispensable role in our efforts to forge a bold and creative arms control policy. At that award ceremony, he spoke to the contribution to strategic defense, the movement toward peace and a reduction of the risk of war. As I experienced in the United States, really, was basically isolationist. And at one time, I agreed with that isolationist view. But then I came to a conclusion that that wasn't enough, and that the United States was so powerful that it needed to take an active role in international affairs. I'd always been interested in foreign affairs and international events. And uh, from a age of seven, I really had a clear view that that's what I wanted to do in the long run. Therefore, I was immensely pleased with the award and with the citation. 